Hello everyone, my name is Henry Burton and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles. The goal of this video is for you to come away with both an intuitive and analytical understanding of Bayes' rule, which is one of the most widely used probabilistic relationships in engineering. In fact, Bayes' theorem is at the core of many of the AI and machine learning systems that are very popular today. Now, I am a structural engineer who works at the intersection of earthquakes and the built environment. So the example we will use to develop some intuition about Bayes' rule is from the earthquake engineering space. Now, as with other complex mathematical relationships, there are multiple levels of possible understanding. At the lowest level, or the simplest level, you want to know what each of the variables mean for a given problem you want to know how to find their values and ultimately solve the equation. The next level is being able to understand why the relationship holds, which requires you to go a bit deeper than just being able to plug in the numbers and get an answer. And at the final and arguably most important level, as engineers, we want to be able to know when it's useful for solving real world problems. Now, before getting into the math, we're going to try to gain some intuition about Bayes' theorem. So for that reason, we will deal with these three levels in reverse order. Before dissecting and ultimately deriving the Bayes' theorem equation, I'd like to tell you a story. This story is about a young woman named Halisi. Halisi is 27 years old and lives in San Diego, California. She's a California registered structural engineer and works as a project engineer at a design consulting firm. A few months ago, Halisi was on a much needed vacation on the island of Trinidad, which is part of the twin island nation of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, on that trip, Halisi spent almost every day at the beach, and on this particular day, she was at Maracas Beach, just relaxing, drinking Mai Tais, and doing some people watching. The problem is, Halisi is a bit of a workaholic. So even while on the beach, she is checking her work emails. And on that day, Halisi got an email from one of her coworkers that a magnitude 6.9 earthquake occurred on the southern tip of the Rose Canyon Fault, which runs in the north-south direction off the coast of San Diego. Not only that, but there was strong shaking in the neighborhood where Halisi grew up, and a single residential building collapsed. Now at that point, Halisi immediately puts her structural engineering hat on figuratively speaking, and concludes that it's highly likely that the collapsed building is older and was constructed before seismic codes were introduced. We can illustrate Halisi's degree of belief on this probability scale, which shows that she thinks it is much more likely that the collapsed building is pre-code or older than it is a newer code-conforming building. The exact numbers don't matter much at this point. Now, later that evening, Halisi decides to do some more research on the building inventory in her old neighborhood. And one of the things she learned was that there are many more code-conforming buildings in the neighborhood compared to pre-code buildings. In fact, the ratio of code-conforming to pre-code buildings is on the order of 20 to 1. Now, this made Halisi rethink her initial judgment about the likelihood that the collapsed building is a pre-code building. She thinks to herself, the fact that there are many more code conforming than pre-code buildings should influence her belief about what type of building collapse. Specifically, it would reduce her degree of belief that the collapsed building was a pre-code building. Now, as it turns out, there is a systematic way to reason about the likelihood that the collapsed building was pre-code or code conforming which involves all the essential ingredients that go into understanding Bayes' theorem. So let's start by picturing a representative sample of the buildings in Halisi's old neighborhood. Say, 200 code conforming and 10 pre-code buildings. That way we maintain our 20 to 1 ratio. Now, one of the things that drove Halisi's initial reasoning about the likelihood of which of the two types of buildings collapsed was her knowledge of performance-based earthquake engineering. She knew that for a given level of shaking, a pre-code building has a much higher likelihood of collapse than a code-conforming building. So, for the purposes of putting some numbers to it, we will say that the pre-code building is four times as likely to collapse, all else equal, compared to the modern code-conforming building. 
With that in mind, we will assign a 5% collapse rate to the code-conforming buildings and a 20% collapse rate to the pre-code building. With those collapse probability estimates, it means that we expect two of the pre-code buildings in our sample to collapse and 10 of the code-conforming buildings in our sample to collapse. So the probability that a random collapse building from our sample is pre-code is 2 out of 12, or approximately 17%. And as it turns out, that is way lower than the 85% probability that was based on Halisi's initial reasoning. So even if it turns out to be true that pre-code buildings are four times as likely to collapse compared to code-conforming buildings, that's not enough to overcome the fact that there are 20 times more code-conforming buildings than pre-code buildings in Halisi's old neighborhood. So the key takeaway here is that new evidence, which in this case is the fact that an earthquake occurred and caused the building to collapse, should not completely determine your beliefs in a vacuum. It should update your prior beliefs. Now, what does that have to do with Bayes' rule? Well, we can frame the problem as what's the likelihood that a random building in our inventory is pre-code? Now, if we consider our sample inventory, we know that this number is roughly 5%. Then we can say our evidence represents the fact that an earthquake happened and a building collapsed. So that means we can restrict our sample space only to the expected number of collapsed buildings. Then we computed the probability that a random building is pre-code given that it collapsed during the earthquake. Again, the fact that this building collapsed during the earthquake represents our evidence. Now, thinking a bit more generally, the situations where Bayes' theorem is applicable are those where you have some hypothesis, like a random building in Halisi's old neighborhood is pre-code or older construction. Then you see some new evidence, say that an earthquake occurred and a building in the neighborhood collapsed. You have some prior knowledge related to the hypothesis, such as the fact that there are 20 times the number of modern code-conforming buildings in the neighborhood relative to pre-code buildings. And you want to use all these pieces of information to compute the probability of the hypothesis given the new evidence. Now, in probability theory notation, this vertical bar means given that or conditioned on as in, we are restricting our view of the prior only to the possibilities where the evidence holds. Now, let's go back to our original problem and take a closer look at the pieces of information we used. The first piece of information is the probability that the hypothesis is true before considering the evidence. In our building collapse problem, that's just a fraction of pre-code buildings in the neighborhood, and it was 1 over 20. That number is known as the prior. Then we considered the probability that we would see the evidence given the hypothesis is true, or the probability of collapse given that our building is pre-code. This is the same as the fraction of our pre-code buildings that collapsed in our sample. Notice that we are using this given that or condition on notation again. That just means that we are limiting the space of possibilities to where our hypothesis holds or to pre-code buildings. In Bayes' theorem, this quantity is known as the likelihood. We also need to know the probability of the evidence given that the hypothesis does not hold. And again, in probability theory, this bar over the variable means the complement of, or not, or excluding. So this would be the probability of collapse for the modern code-conforming buildings. Now, with all this notation in place, we can go back to how we computed our answer earlier. We wanted the probability that our hypothesis is true given the evidence. In other words, we want the probability that a random building in the neighborhood is pre-code given that this building collapsed during an earthquake. Now, we started with the number of pre-code buildings in our sample space that fit the evidence or the number of collapsed pre-code buildings in our sample space, and that number was 2. And that number was divided by the total number of buildings that fit the evidence or the total number of collapsed buildings in our sample space, and that number was 12. 
So where do these numbers come from? The numerator, or the 2, is the total number of buildings shown as n subscript b here times the prior probability that a random building in our sample is pre-code or the probability that our hypothesis is true times the probability of the evidence given our hypothesis is true or the probability of collapse given that the random building is pre-code. In the denominator, we have the same number as the numerator, but we need to add in the rest, which is the number of buildings that are not pre-code or the number of code-conforming buildings times the probability of the evidence or collapse given a code-conforming building. Now, notice that the total number of buildings cancels out, which makes sense because we chose an arbitrary number of buildings in our neighborhood for the sake of illustration. What we are left with now is a more abstract equation that is based purely on probabilities or Bayes' theorem. Now, there are a couple more things to note before we wrap this up. The first is the last piece of jargon in our formulation. The term on the left-hand side of the Bayes' rule equation is described as the posterior. Also, more often, you would see the denominator of the right-hand side as the probability of E or the total probability of seeing the evidence. In our problem, that would be the fraction of collapsed buildings in the sample space. However, when applying Bayes' theorem in practice, to calculate the denominator, you almost always have to break it down into the part corresponding to where the hypothesis is true and the part where it is not. Now, while we did have to go through a lot of technical details and jargon, the most important thing you can keep in mind is that Bayes' rule lets you systematically quantify changing beliefs. And the theorem is widely used in structural engineering. For example, in earthquake engineering, we use it for something called seismic hazard disaggregation. That's just a fancy term to describe when we are trying to figure out what characteristics of an earthquake, say, for example, the magnitude, are likely to produce a given level of ground shaking. We also use it to update mathematical models used in structural response simulations. And we also use it for something called real-time risk assessment of distributed infrastructure. So in this context, maybe an earthquake occurred and we have a model that predicts the level of damage to say a water distribution network. And as we move forward in time, we collect data about the actual damage and we can update our model to give new and better predictions. Okay, thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it useful.